very warm introduction. Uh, I think we've got a terrific program uh, for you this evening. Uh, and uh, in order to help uh, Patrick Carr, I thought it would be useful as a sociologist, as I'm always doing surveys, I wanted to do a bit of a survey here. And I wanted to see a show of hands of how many of you were raised in a small town, I'd find that of less than 5,000, who now live in an urban area, if you'd see your hands. Okay, Patrick, now turn around. There's a lot of us that were raised in small towns or on farms that now live in the city. It's important. Is that the same place? Pardon? Is that the same place as that now? Yeah, we'll let it go. Okay. Uh, that's okay. Uh, I think it's always important that you know your audience, and so there are a lot of us that have participated in, in what I believe is one of the more important issues facing not only rural Iowa, but rural America, and that is what I call the selective migration of our young people. I happen to represent one of those. Hollowing out is a, is a topic that all of us that are concerned about the future of rural America uh, should read and, more importantly, should understand. It's the selective out-migration of some of our best and brightest that, in fact, I think poses a real risk to many communities because it represents, in many cases, the loss of their future. The future is our young people, and without young people staying in those communities, raising their families and creating jobs, uh, creating self-employment opportunities. And so when I first read Patrick's book, I said, this is, this is important. This is the message that everyone concerned about rural development uh, needs, needs to read. So it's, so it's my, uh, my pleasure this evening to introduce to you, uh, Patrick, uh, and I want to tell you just a bit uh, about uh, the hollowing out the middle of the rural brain drain and what it means for America. Uh, so Patrick was born and raised in, in Ireland. Uh, earned his bachelor and master's degree from the uh, University College, Dublin. And in 1992, he was awarded the prestigious National University of Ireland Traveling Studentship to pursue graduate study abroad. And in 1998, uh, he earned his PhD in sociology at the University of Chicago. Now, Professor Carr uh, writes extensively about crime and communities, uh, uh, youth and adolescence, and the transition to adulthood. And it is for, in his first book that some of you may have read, uh, Clean Streets, that was published by uh, New York University Press. Just a bit of an aside for those of you that are interested, and in, in Patrick, uh, with your interest in, in, in crime and youth, a second book that, that I think has an equally important message about the fate of many rural communities is the 2009 book by Mark Redding uh, entitled Methland. The, the Death and Life of an American Small Town. If you've not read it, if you, put, if you put Patrick's book together with Mark Redding's book, it does paint a very serious problem. You know, not unlike prohibition, when there were not jobs, uh, people started manufacturing boot, uh, moonshine and bootlegging. Uh, in some ways, I think the meth epidemic is, uh, is a very synonymous. Well, back to, back to Patrick. Uh, uh, he, he lectures to audiences uh, all over the world about uh, community policing and, and crime control, and he and, and his research have been featured in, in numerous media outlets, including NPR. Um, Professor Carr is an associate member of the MacArthur Foundation Network on Transitions to Adulthood, and he teaches in the Department of Sociology at Rutgers University in New Brunswick, where he is an associate professor. Presently, with support uh, from the Department of Justice, the Edward uh, Ryan Grant 
uh, Karn and his spouse, uh, Maria Kalfelis, are conducting interviews with 150 young people from Philadelphia's most dangerous neighborhoods and about their perceptions of crime, violence, and the police. Their research has inspired a youth-led anti-violence campaign called the Respect Campaign. Uh, Patrick and Maria uh, are married. They live outside of Philadelphia with their two children. And so now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce you to Professor Patrick Carr. And um, he's going to tell us about Ellis, Iowa. Uh, for those of you, like myself, that, that are quite familiar with the state, I said, oh my God, I've, I was 952 towns. I've missed Ellis, but if you've read the preface of his book, you know that that's a pseudonym for the real site study done here in Iowa. Professor Carr. Well, how do you follow that? Um, well, one thing I won't be doing is I won't be uh, uh, touting my lack of depth of knowledge about farming and agriculture because I'll be showing up in the Q&A. Um, I am delighted to be here, delighted to be part of the AVID series. Uh, as uh, I want to just say a couple of quick thank yous to Jan Kaiser and to Bill Fredericks who have been my wonderful hosts. Uh, Bill uh, put no pressure on me today by saying, wow, you're the leadoff hitter for this series. <laughs> and so I had visions of you know, me that didn't grow up playing baseball and I'm thinking to myself, well, the one thing I can't do is strike out. So I was thinking about what, what I say to my son. I pass on the limited itsy bitsy knowledge I have of baseball just from watching it. And I say, son, when you go up there, just make sure you make contact. <laughs> so that's, that's my job tonight is to, to be a contact hitter for, for this. And I think it is, it's, a, it's an issue, as Paul pointed out, that uh, when we began to write about this, we imagined if we didn't imagine this kind of response or would be you know, part of a series like this, but we imagined starting a conversation about this issue because we felt, and maybe it's because we come from a city and you know, we'd never really done work on rural America before, we felt that this was an issue that had really largely flown under the radar. Uh, and so part of the, the remit of what we're trying to do here is to, is to begin this conversation uh, in many places. And since the book has been published, we have been all over trying to do just that. So that's kind of the, the, the brief. So let me start with a question. Uh, and this is a question that we, we got from our publishers when they saw the first draft of the manuscript, you know, and our publishers are in Boston, Massachusetts, you know, and they're liberal East Coast intellectuals types, right? Um, and so we wrote what we thought was a, you know, pretty decent first draft, we we're very happy with it sent it off. And so they, they got back to us and they said, why do we care? <laughs> All right. Oh yeah, I know. Right. Try and contain your apoplexy. <laughs> because we, we, were, we were right there with you, let me tell you. Why do we care about this? This is just how it always is, right? You boom, you bust, some win, some lose, so some towns die, why do we care? If a dot in the landscape disappears, you know, will we really notice? So we got angry about this because we'd spent years writing this book. And we said, well, it's important. Well, show us why it's important. And it's funny because, you know, your book and your experiences, this was several years ago, I got an email from a guy in western Kansas today, of all days, and he said he'd read the book, his dad had read it, and um, he read it too, and he blogged about it. And he wrote to us and he said, um, I like the book, and you should read my review, and I, said, you know, and I did. He said, but you didn't answer the question, why, why should we care? And we thought we did, because what we did was we did what all sociologists do, we polled people, right? We got onto a bunch of people we know here in Iowa, and we said, so tell us again, you know, our publishers say this is something that, you know, people on the coast are not gonna care about. You know, and they got angry, and they got apoplectic, and they said, well, you should care, because Small towns matter. One in five people in America lives in a non-metropolitan or a small town, right? 
most of our food is produced here in the Midwest, where small towns are all over the place. Small towns send a disproportionate number of people into the armed services. The people who go and fight and in many cases die for our country. There are many, many reasons to care. So I just wanted to pose that question and I hope I'll get to you know, several more reasons why we should care and what we can maybe do uh, about this issue and this uh, problem. So very, very quickly, let me just paint the problem for you. And I know you know those people who've read the book will know, but just to get us on some kind of train of thought here so we can go on a journey, so to speak. So when I talk to audiences, I, I ask people to imagine this as a continuum, like many things. So on one end, you have a, a robust small town. Right? This is a thriving place that has jobs. You can raise a family there, earn a wage. Your kids can do better than you can do. And there are enough young families raising young children to keep the local school not only open, but vibrant, right? The healthy small town on one end. And on the other end of the continuum, you have the small town that is practically hollowed out. It's on its knees. Most young people who can have left. The population is aging. There are no jobs. The main street is pretty much shuttered. Everybody shops in the big box retailers that are 25 miles away. There is no bank. The pharmacy closed a long time ago. The nearest doctor is 60 miles away. And now, there aren't enough kids to keep the school open. And the school closes. That's the, the end point of hollowing out. That's when it gets as bad as it could be, right? Where the dot on the landscape is about to disappear. Now, as with any continuum, most every place is between those two poles. But here's the thing about the rural crisis, is that this has gone on for so long, and as one commentator described it, this is a, a crisis that has seeped. You can imagine the, the language there. It's something that has happened so gradually that many towns have gone from the robust end of the continuum, traveling along that line towards the hollowed out. And maybe, because it has happened over such a long period of time, it's not as dramatic or as sudden as the urban crisis was in the 70s. Something that was visible, that got a lot of attention, both scholarly and in terms of policy, in terms of tax dollars. The rural crisis is one that, as I said at the outset, has flown largely under the radar. So what are some of the the indicators of this. In terms of the broad demographics of this, there are several things to pay attention to, and Professor Lasley could certainly put more flesh in the bone than I can, but just generally. So between 1980 and 2000, close to somewhere between 650 and 700 non-metro counties, sort of rural counties in America, lost at least 10% of their population. Because of the population loss. Specifically, though, if you look at that more closely, the population loss is driven by the young and disproportionately those who are educated. So you have the out-migration, the selective out-migration that Professor Lasley talked about of the young and the educated. Also, another trend is the natural decrease in population, slightly different than the out-migration. And this is where, again, measured relatively recently between 2000 and 2005, Again, over 600 counties, some of them the same places, had more deaths than births. So there's not natural replacement. More people are dying than are being born in these places. So you have several things there. You have people leaving. You have this natural decrease. You have, in many cases, a rapid aging of the population. Ellis itself, aged by, the median age jumped by 10 years in two decades, which is a lot. One uh, commentator, I, I was at a, a forum in Minneapolis, kind of made this joke. It was kind of a half a joke, but not really. You know, he said, well, you know, in many of these places, the 70-year-olds are driving the 90-year-olds around. That that you know, is a testament to how quickly and how suddenly places have aged. Other things to think about. 
your aging population, also medically underserved areas. Over 40% of the non-metro counties in Iowa have at least two medically underserved areas. And those statistics are probably a little bit out of date, they're from about three years ago. So areas that don't have primary care physicians, dentists, nurses, and so on, places where, you know, like that hollowing out place where you have to drive in some cases an hour, maybe two hours to see your primary care physician. Okay, that's, those are some of just the indicators. We talk about some of the causes. And again, broad brush strokes here. Causes at the macro level, the larger level. Again, I defer to Professor Lasley on this, but just broadly speaking, the changes in agriculture that have been cumulative over the last, you can, you can take any period of time, just say, last, say the last 50 years. Partly that is the move towards mechanization, partly that is the 1980s farm crisis, where you know, many people lost their livelihoods. Part of that is the, the sort of consolidation of smaller farms into bigger farms. Every five years, there's a census of agriculture in the state of Iowa. Twos and sevens, right? Right. So 82, 87, 92, 97, and so on, am I right? And if you look at the figures, I mean, look at the figures for the county where Ellis is at, you can see between 1982 and 1997 just how many small farms got swallowed up into larger entities. The independent small farmer is a thing of the past in many cases. It was difficult for us to find somebody to interview in their 20s back nine, 10 years ago when we were doing the work who, whose sole occupation was farming. We found one, and I swear I almost threw a butterfly net over the guy because I was so excited. I was like, a live farmer, <laughs> gotcha. It was an awesome interview. This guy just lived it, breathed it, slept it, he loved farming. But you know, he's an anomaly, right? He's a throwback. Not only the changes in the size of farming and the migration of people off the land for their primary mode of employment, but the changes in agricultural industry more generally. Here are just one or two little tasters of the changes in food processing. And I could talk for a long time about this, but I'm just going to throw one out at you. About 15 or 16 years ago, the average meat packer earned a little bit over 12 bucks an hour. The average meat packer now, controlling for inflation or whatever else, 16 years later, earns a little more than minimum wage, somewhere in the mid fives, and has fewer benefits. That's just one change. And you know, again, you can see that you know, big agriculture, the large conglomerates have moved in. They've, in many cases, de-skilled, made those jobs lesser jobs with fewer benefits, and in many cases, jobs that are inherently unsafe, in unsafe working conditions, where OSHA regulations are not being followed and so on. Again, lots of things to talk about there, but changes in agriculture. The other large-scale macro changes that have impacted small towns, the other bellwether of many small towns is industry, manufacturing. The downsizing, the outsourcing, the shedding of tens of thousands of manufacturing jobs. Uh, I was trying to pull together you know, an accurate figure for the number of manufacturing jobs that Iowa lost in the last 10 years. And I wasn't able to find a definitive one, but from sort of adding jobs that were lost between 2000 and 2004 and so on, and just I came up with a figure of around about 70,000 70, plus manufacturing jobs that were lost. If I was to guess, and again, I'm not wholly certain about this, most of those would have been in small and medium-sized towns. And it's not just the loss of jobs, it's the downsizing of the job itself that matters. So we talked to people who worked in John Deere uh, in Waterloo, commutable from Ellis, long commute, but it's actually commutable. And the guy said, well, you know, my father worked in John Deere, my grandfather worked in John Deere, I got a start there, they laid me off. Then six months later, they hired me back to do practically the same job at half the wage and no benefits. So the downsizing of the actual job itself, the job itself doesn't pay what it did six months ago. In a tight labor market, you can do that. 
particularly when you're a big corporation who are trying to please your shareholders and keep your price up, right? So those are some of the bigger causes. Okay, so there are also causes at the micro level, at the level of the towns themselves. And in many cases, and this is one of the things that we write about very strongly in the book, the towns themselves collude in their own demise. And in some cases, they do it unconsciously. And they do it simply by doing this. They invest the majority of their resources in the young people that are most likely to leave and not come back. That's like taking your money and putting it in a basket and flinging it out the window and then saying, gee, now where did my money go again? How did we arrive at this? Okay, this was a study that, you know, kind of was one of those serendipitous happenstances. We were hired initially just to do a study of young adults. It's part of a, a larger national study of what was it like to be a young adult in 21st century America in different places. Big cities, New York, San Diego, Midwest metropolitan areas, Minneapolis, St. Paul, suburban Detroit, and Maria and I were hired to develop a site in non-metro America. It just so happened we had ties to Ellis. And, you know, oh, they said, oh, great. Great place, that's perfect, it's not near any big city. So we went there and we got the lists of incoming freshmen who entered Ellis High School to graduate in the late 80s and early 90s. So by the time we caught up with them in 2002, 2003, they were in their mid-20s or in their late 20s. So two groups of kids. And what we found was that the answer to the question of coming of age for anybody who's grown up in a small town is the answer to two uh, fundamental but interrelated questions. And those are very simply, do you stay or do you go? And secondly, if you go, do you ever go back? And by talking to these young people in their mid-twenties, it was actually perfect because this was something they had faced relatively recently in their lives, these two questions. And the pathways they had taken in answer to those two questions had sort of, you know, suggested these different tracks. And then as they spoke more about how they were mentored and nurtured and cultivated growing up, we began to see patterns emerging. So we identified three broad groups, the leavers, the stayers, and the returners. And I'm just going to mention you know, some of the subgroups and, and how they sort of are different from one another and how we kind of arrived at the conclusions that we did. So our leavers, the first group are what we call the achievers. And the achievers are those kids who get the disproportionate amount of resources invested in them growing up. They're the first chair in the orchestra. They're the National Honor Society kid. They're the kids who are bound to go off and do great things somewhere else. One young woman talked about how she felt that she had been set forth to do something with what I had been given, which is a wonderfully evocative way of describing the process. Certainly she's talented, but it was that collective investment in her. Another young woman talked about how she felt that the town had her back. Right? That there was this collective investment in her, wanting her, willing her to do well, willing her to excel. Others talked about how it was drummed into them early on that they have to leave in order to succeed. Success is not something that can be gotten by staying that you have to leave to succeed. And these are the groups that, and again, they'll talk about it themselves. They felt that they were given the lion's share of resources, that it wasn't fair, but that they benefited greatly from this. And small towns have always done this really well. One of my favorite new statistics that I collected recently, uh, and I think I was telling the students at Simpson today, we had a great conversation there this afternoon, how there was a study on NFL quarterbacks and they found that where they were from matters greatly to the point where quarterbacks from small towns, I think it was 5,000 or less population, 
were uh, overrepresented by a factor of 10 in the NFL. Because they're the, they're the achievers, right? These are the kids that not only are they great athletes, but they're great NFL quarterbacks because they're leaders, because they're imbued with those qualities they have been invested in from day one, and they believe in their abilities and so on, right? Not just about how strong your arm is, but all of those other intangibles that a small town does so well. Our second group of leavers are kids who want to get out just as much as the achievers do, but for whom there isn't that investment. These are what we call the seekers, and their route out of town, their road away, is through the military. Not always, but more often than not. So, this is the way to see the world, get an education, in some cases a skill, and that's certainly how we sell our young people in the army these days, right? We say, you sign up now and you give us however many years, we'll give you in some cases a $30,000 bonus, you'll have money for college, you'll have qualifications and so on. One of the most heartbreaking things about talking to the seekers, and we, we followed up a lot of these guys over time, not just, it wasn't just a one-shot deal, was talking with them either when they had finished their tours of duty or were about to do so, about what they were going to do next, and finding how ill-prepared they were for life after the military. One of them that really sticks in my mind is a young woman who was a naval nurse and had served several tours in the Persian Gulf, seen a lot of action. Um, was so good at what she did that she was an instructor. And she said, here's the thing, now if I leave tomorrow and I want to be a nurse, I have to start from scratch. None of the skills, none of the qualifications I have are transferable for college credit towards a nursing degree. So I have to go back to go. That's a, that's a I think a shameful thing in many respects. In some ways, I, and that's not the only shameful thing we have in how we treat our veterans, but certainly that one sticks in my mind. Our stayers. Our stayers are the group who are the future for small towns. They're the guys who are there. They're the guys for whom, when we ask the question, what would ever make you leave? And the nonsensical question. Are you crazy? Why are you even asking me that? I have no intention of leaving. I was born here, I'm going to die here, right? They're like the... John Cougar Mellencamp, or John Mellencamp, whatever he's called now, son, right? That <laughs> Mellencamp is the common theme, right? You know the guy. Indiana, anyway, so we don't really, right? He's one of them. Um, these are the guys in whom there is virtually no investment. So the, one, one guy explained the hierarchy of high school to us like this. He said, okay, so you had your smart kids, and you had your medium kids, and you had your low kids, and here's me, and I'm way down below the low kids. These are the guys who felt completely ill-prepared for the modern world of work. Didn't have the skills, didn't have the computer skills. Part of that was the time they were born, but part of that too was not realizing what they needed to do not realizing what careers might be available to them or what skills they might need to accrue along the way to get them. Because nobody took the time to spend time with them, to mentor them, and tell them this is what they needed to do. They regret it now. They went to work early at 16 years of age. They were pulling in two, 250 bucks a week. They were kings. They could run their own car, pay for their own clothes, and still have money left over to party on the weekend. At 25 and 26, they're earning 200, $250 a week, doing the same job, and no prospects for any kind of advancement. And they know it. And they coulda, shoulda, woulda. I shoulda listened, I shoulda done, but in truth, they were allowed to slip through the cracks. Because they're not the easiest to work with. And they didn't particularly care about school. And they might have been disruptive a day or two, or three. Those are our stairs. Our returners are of two groups. The one we call boomerangs. A boomerang, you always throw a boomerang knowing that it's going to come back. 
The boomerangs are usually young women who leave for a period of time always knowing they are coming back to a small town. Sometimes they leave for education, sometimes they leave for job training, some have associate's degrees, some have professional certifications. They come back to small towns after a short period of time and many of them marry stairs. They're also the future of small towns, although they're better situated than the stairs. But again, these young women, when they're honest with us, would say that nobody really took the time out to help them along the way when they were growing up either, that they pretty much had to do most of it by themselves. And then finally, our small subset of uh, returners that we call high flyers. And the high flyers are the group that everybody wants. And one of our sort of epiphanies in, in writing this was when the local Rotary asked us to come and talk about our research, and you get excited when you're a sociologist. Come talk about your research. Can I run over there? When do you want it? Do you want it now? So we went over and we talked about the research. Oh, yeah, 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 that's fine, that's fine, that's fine. Let's get to the, the, real, the real point for us asking you here is, how do we get doctors to move to Ellis? And we said, well, that's a tough one. Because you do such a good job in greasing the rails for people to leave, it's very, very difficult to reel them back in. And yet every small town wants these guys. And they're important, let's face it. You need your professionals. You need your medical professionals. You need your teachers. You need entrepreneurs to open up businesses, to stimulate the economy, to build jobs. You need these guys. And here's the kicker. Every state, almost every state that faces this issue, I go through a laundry list of policies that are absolute failures or ones that we just don't know if they're going to work out just yet. They're all incentives. Let's make our cities cool. Let's give them tuition remission. Let's give them loan forgiveness. Let's give them free land. In Kansas, they do that. Or the Iowa one, which I love because it's very mannerly, and it says, come back to Iowa, please. <laughs> I love that. Now in Philly, it would be, come back to Philly, exclamation point. What's your problem? <laughs> Different sensibility, I love it. Um, what those policies, what they really, where they miss the point is this. The high flyers we spoke to don't come back because of the incentives. They come back for affective and emotional reasons. So one young woman who was a doctor came back to a town about 10 miles south of Ellis, identical size, and then, you know, pretty much the same place, different name, and they would argue that they're completely different, but they're really not. Um, and she, I said, so why? And she and her husband, they're both professionals. She said, well, we could have moved to Des Moines, sunny Des Moines, right? Uh, and we could have earned three times as much as we earn now but I wanted to be close to my family and I wanted to raise my kids in a place like I was raised. It's not about the incentives. You can't incentivize emotion. Economists would disagree, but I, I believe that you can't. So we, we missed the boat there. Now there are ways you can stimulate a flow of professionals back to a place I'll talk about when we talk about solutions, but there's our, our five groups. Okay, so the take-home point is this. If you overinvest in those most likely to leave and not come back, you're really leading yourself down a path, a debilitating path, especially at a time when the opportunities for those who stay and for many who return have either shrunk or they're worse than they were 20 years ago. It was always assumed, one of the counselors we spoke with, you know, about the stairs. Well, they'll just get a job. Not anymore. And certainly not the kind of job that their, their parents would have got. And so the ground has shifted, and so the practices that small towns have always done, you have to sort of begin to re-examine them. And moreover, examine your role in this, in this process. Okay. All right, so that's the research. And... I'm going to get on to what can be done, and I'm going to do it relatively quickly because I do want to keep as much time for, for questions as possible. And here's the good news. Since we published this book, I'm much more optimistic 
that not only are people really on, on top of this, but that some of the thinking out there and some of the things that are going on really show signs of working or are actually working. So that's the good news. Okay. Um, so in terms of one of the first things that has to happen, there has to be a broad set of educational reforms. This is a very difficult thing to do, particularly at a time when resources are scarce, budgets are being cut, and we have a national educational agenda that is predicated on one thing and one thing only. Well, two things, actually. K through 12, it's about testing and you know, getting more people to test better. Right? We're racing to the top, we're not leaving any people behind, and so on. And yet our employers are telling us that people are coming out of high school with none of the basic skills that they need for any of the jobs that are out there. Okay, so that's our K through 12. And then beyond that, we are hoodwinked, and I'm using that word deliberately, by this mantra of college for all. Everybody has to get a four-year degree. Everybody doesn't have to get a four-year degree. Center for Education and Labor Force at Georgetown University says that between 2008 and 2018, there will be 43 million jobs created in America. Two-thirds of those jobs will require some college. Break that down. 34% will require a BA. 30% require either a certification or an associate's degree. There are currently 17 million young people out there working in the labor force who have a BA or better who are doing jobs that do not require a BA. They're not all struggling actresses and actors, artists who are bussing tables. Not all of you, right? There's a mismatch. That's just some of the things. But it's okay, so what can we do? One, we need to equalize our investments. Very simply, at the level of small towns, non-metro areas, we need to equalize the investments across the different groups of young people. Again, putting all your eggs in the basket that's on its way out of town is a non-starter. It's not that you don't invest in, in the achievers. I think the achievers will be fine with just a little less. It's not a zero-sum game either. It's about targeting your resources. It's about mentoring. It's about career advice and planning at earlier ages in middle school and mapping these young people to the skills that they need and to the opportunities that exist and will exist in their regions. Can, can be done, and it is actually being done. Um, also, what needs to happen at the level of education is working across bureaucracies. So, school districts. From school districts to community colleges, to Votex, to four-year colleges, to universities. Having all of these groups working together to give our young people the skills that they need and the preparation that they need for the workforce. Some of this is actually happening already. Steve Oval from Kirkwood Community College is here in the audience and I have to say uh, my conversations with him, we've written a new afterword for the book, the new edition of the book, and I'm going to give you the, the thumbnail of it so you don't have to buy it. If Beacon Press knew that, they'd fire me immediately because I'm, I'm not doing enough to shift units. But anyway, the Jones Regional Education Center in Monticello, Monticello or Cello? Cello? I always get that wrong. I like the cello. Anyway, Monticello, Iowa, opened several years back. And what they do is they have a, a series of career academy classes where they draw young people from local high schools in a, eight, four counties? Five counties. Five counties, eight school districts, right? And they skill these guys and they match them up with areas of need in the local economy. They also provide you know, courses that can be also cashed in for college credit for those who want to go on to an associate's degree or whatever else. But crucially, they're meeting the needs of the stayers because they know what they need in their local economy and they're matching them up with those skills and they're doing it at the level of the high school and allowing the high schools to educate students in areas that they wouldn't have the resources to do otherwise. This is a win-win, and I believe that's a model for not just the kinds of skilling, but the kind of educational thinking 
across boundaries and across districts and across levels of bureaucracy that has to happen if we're going to do the right thing. Now, notice that that goes in the opposite direction from our national policy. That's not about college for all. That's not about achieving things on standardized tests. That's about teaching people what they need. We need to do more of that. And it's an outstanding example of what can work. And I've been preaching this everywhere I go. The second thing that needs to happen, and part of it happens in education, but more generally is regional planning. I was just out in western Kansas last week, and you know they were talking about how you know resources are thin on the ground, and you know particularly when you've declining enrollments and so on, and all these things. And we talked about you know well some of the things that you can do, and they said, well, what can we do when our budgets are being cut? And I said, well, you know that's that's the hardest kind of atmosphere to do anything positive in, but you can creatively think of what resources you can combine with other people. And if you plan regionally, that's possible. So you have a school that has career planning in one area that's very strong, and a school that has career planning in another area that's very strong. If you pool them, then everybody has access to both areas. It's just a simple example, but again, thinking regionally, getting all of the stakeholders in terms of business, agriculture, community leaders, politicians, educators at the same table. It's not that that's going to be easy, you wave a magic wand and suddenly all your problems will disappear, it's going to be hard. You're going to have to work with the people who ticked you off five years ago at the baseball tournament. Right? So be it. You're going to have to bury that and move on. Again, there are examples of this happening here. One of the sort of more stunning examples of a turnaround, uh, what the people who were involved in it described to me as a collective epiphany was what they did in Newton, Iowa. So Newton loses Maytag. Here's a town that was a one company town. It should have been dead and buried. Really should have, you know, really, if you were been sane about it, you would have boarded up that town and moved on. It's done. But the business leaders, the educators, the community colleges got involved, people from Marshalltown got involved and said, okay, what can we do here? What are some of the things we can do to rebound from what should be a completely debilitating loss? But they worked regionally, they planned regionally, they pooled their resources, and yes, okay, when you have a catastrophic event, it's easy to have what they describe as a collective epiphany, but they retrofitted one plant, they built a new plant, they bought in, brought in two green energy companies, one to make turbines, one to make blades, right, for wind turbines. Retrained a lot of the workforce, some of them to work in the turbine industries, some of them to work in other industries, again, partnering with DMAC to do that. And again, it's an outstanding example of what regional planning can do. They didn't sort of say, well, we can only plan in this region and our boundary is right here, so we need to stop. They didn't see boundaries. They saw partners, they saw resources that could be combined, and they did it. So it can happen. Lastly, in terms of things that work and the future of small towns, I've said to the stairs, sort of, you know, investing in the stairs um, in terms of their job skills and so forth. There's also the issue of being civically engaged. So the question that many small towns have, right, who are going to be the leaders in the next decade, two decades? So I want to take you out a little bit west of here to Minor, South Dakota. Minor you know, has the very same issues that you know, we talk about in the book, in terms of losing its young and its educated, and so on. And they, they had gotten onto this quite a while ago, and they started by having a reading group, yay for libraries, right? Libraries were in, in, the, in the lead on that. And they said, well, what do we need to do in terms of our, our young people? Well, one of the things we need to do is to sort of offer them education in civic engagement. How to be a leader, a leadership course. And they started that in the high school. The guy um, who's the sort of 
a leader of the rural learning center there was a teacher at the high school and he started this leadership course and the proof of how well it has worked is that the the mayor of minor south dakota now is a 24 year old young man who was one of the first graduates of that leadership course he's a stayer he's proud of it he's doing great things for his town again a simple thing growing your own growing your own leaders growing your own professionals here's a way to grow your own professionals how do we get doctors to come back what if you strike a deal with an achiever before they leave the question I'm asked where it goes, how do, we, how do we know who the achievers are? Ask any educator, ask any teacher in a school, in a middle school. Sometimes even in an elementary school in a small town, they'll tell you. And say, listen, you're interested in medicine? Why don't you shout out the local doctor? If you're still interested while you're in high school, we'll draw up a contract. We'll pay for all or half of your medical school tuition if you give us 10 years when you graduate. That's a great deal. It's, it's a great deal for a small town. It's a great deal for the young person. It's a better deal for a small town. You get them for 10 years after they graduate, what's going to happen? They're 26, 27 when they graduate. In those 10 years between 26 and 36, they're going to do two things. Get married, have a family, and then you have them for life. They'll put those roots down, and they're not going to leave. And you've just ensured with a small investment, relatively small, that you can keep your medical center open, that you can keep young teachers coming to your, your school, lawyers, whatever it is, whatever you want to invest in, for small money, you can ensure that those professionals come back. It's very, very difficult to do that, to hook them back when they're gone. So you can grow your own for pennies on the dollar in many ways. Okay. So I've probably talked long enough, but what I want to sort of leave with is this. When we published this book in uh, September, October 2009, it's one of those weird things. You send it forth into the world, you don't know what's going to happen. We've been amazed at the, the interest and the way it's resonated and how, in many ways, it is helping to, if not start the conversation, certainly increase it and expand it. We're a lot more hopeful than we were then about things that work because simply we've seen them. We've been to these places. We've talked to people like Steve and Kim Didier, who was one of the people, key people at Newton. There is hope, and I think the answer to the question is this. The places I've been, I think, and I say this not facetiously or in any way condescendingly, the small towns I've been in, I think, are all worth saving. Absolutely they are. They're part of what makes this country great. They're part of the rich diversity that is American life. As Maria's father, who's a Greek immigrant from a small island that's near Turkey, it's from Kios, when we said we were going to do this project and we're going to move to, you know, Alice, he said, well, that's the real America. And he's right. It's a part of it. It's part of the real America. And it would be a shame and a terrible loss to this country if we stood by when many places can and should be saved. The good news is I believe it can be done. I believe that with a vision and a plan and the will that exists in these places to do it, that hollowing out is not inevitable. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Professor Carr. And now I think it's time that we engage in, uh, the audience will give questions and you'll give answers. Uh, that's the way this works. Uh, but I think on, in your packet, there were, there's a slip for you to write down your questions. And yes, and Jan's holding one up there. And if, You'll collect those or pass them in. My job is to read your handwriting 
interpret your questions and solicit uh, uh, response from Patrick. So, uh, unfortunately, they have us outnumbered, Patrick. You cannot answer all the questions from each individual here. So, I will do a very quick sort of questions, and uh, if if they are as you pass them in, we'll be we're going to try to get through as many as we can uh, in the next few minutes. Can you hear me? There's an advantage of being a fast writer. Uh, so the first, the first question, uh, Patrick, uh, is the is a brief study guide available, or will soon be published on your study of Ellis Island? This person is looking maybe for. This probably came from a student that's looking for a cheat sheet, in other words, a cliff note version of your book. Um, the, the short answer is there, there kind of is one. We, we, have, we hadn't thought about doing it, but we, we've done an online study where we put together questions for portions of the book for a group in north central Pennsylvania. So I'm happy to share that with people or not. You know, it's not... Um, available yet, but we can probably either share it or put it up on the book website for people to take a look. So, uh, the advice would be just to look in a few weeks. Uh, yeah, in about a month, I'd say we'd be able to put it up there, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Oh, they're rolling in. Well, here's a... You don't write need, I'm not going to read your questions. Um, but some people have taken pensmanship, and here's a good one. How, how will the move to sustainable organic food sources affect both agriculture and small communities? That's a terrific question. I, I didn't really ex expand on, you know, what are some possible changes in agriculture that could, could help. Uh, small town communities, but but there, I, I think there's potential there, and I think, you know, th there's at least some evidence that, you know, in terms of or organic food products, in terms of restaurants that, you know, are locavore restaurants that use only food that's grown locally, that those have been growing, and back east in our blue state liberal, you know, haze of of do gooderness. Um, one of the things I have noticed is that if you go to you know, a couple of the stores that are near us late on a Friday or Saturday, all of the organic milk is sold out. Now, it's still a small part of the, the overall you know, market for milk. But what's interesting about that is that there was more of it than there was five years ago. And certainly, it, it didn't exist as an option ten years ago. What's even more interesting is that people are willing to pay two bucks more a gallon for it. So it's not that there's a financial incentive for them to do it. They're doing it because they want the product. Um, you know, there's community-supported agriculture, which is gaining an importance and in popularity near where we live from, you know, areas in southeastern Pennsylvania and South Jersey. Um, but here's the thing. Let's not kid ourselves. That will bring some people back to farming. I think there's going to be a market for it. But the vast majority of the money in agriculture is still in Big Ag's pocket. So we can talk all we like about how, you know, that might happen, but let's be honest about that. Now, here's one thing that could change the game slightly. There are almost no incentives for sustainable agriculture and organic, or sustainable slash organic agriculture. Almost none. Am I right? Right. And the vast majority, all the incentives are for big ag. Now, if we level that playing field just a little bit, you might again see changes. Again, you're, you're, you're offering an incentive for it doesn't exist. That's only the same incentive that the bigger producers have, 
which I don't, I, I know there's a big lobby um, that would sort of oppose that. But again, that's one way you could stimulate it. But let's not be, you know, go crazy here. We're not going to all turn to grass-fed beef and, you know, local breweries, although that sounds kind of appealing to me. <laughs> Thank you for that question, and, and uh, uh, a, a question of a different sort, but one that's terribly important in Iowa. Uh, Patrick, a uh, person must know uh, any studies on settling of immigrants and refugees in, in rural areas instead of urban areas. And that's, that's a big issue in Iowa. Some thoughts on that? I have a lot of thoughts on that. Um, Mark Ray and his colleagues up at the University of Northern Iowa uh, have written extensively about immigration in small towns and medium-sized towns in Iowa. And a lot of that was driven in, in part by, you know, food processing and, and big ag, bringing people in because they could pay them next to nothing. And one of the reasons, I didn't mention it when I threw out the statistic, statistic at you, one of the reasons that the wages in meatpacking declined so precipitously was bringing in immigrant labor in many cases undocumented labor, because you could pay them that much, and they'd take it. And one of the things that got lost in the postal raid, <clears throat> which has cost upwards of $9 million for the, the US taxpayer, split families apart, it's just a complete nightmare, is this. In the 18 months prior to that raid, there were almost 150 health and safety violations at that plant. And again, it just, I mean, the sort of unsafe working conditions, the lack of the ability to organize for a decent wage with benefits and so on, you know, are, are some of the issues here. Now, in terms of, in terms of immigrants, um, one of the things that, you know, and it's, it's very difficult, this is a difficult sell in a lot of places, one of the things that can absolutely economically save a small town is immigration. Uh, Dan Lichter and, and I and Maria are actually writing a piece on Hispanic boom towns and the potential for them to be one of the things going forward that we can do well. Now, here's the kicker. That immigration, in many cases, think of Storm Lake, think of Postville, think of Hazleton, Iowa, or no, Hazleton, Pennsylvania, rather, Manassas, Virginia, Lewis, Lewiston, Maine, and so on, all these places. That immigration came rapidly and transformed these places very, very quickly. That kind of change brings with it a lot of issues and a lot of problems. And when it's not done right, and in most places it hasn't been done right, it can be very damaging to local communities. Now, I'm not getting into issues of in-groups and out-groups here, but just the change itself can be destabilizing. So there are many examples of where immigration has been done wrong. However, there are one or two examples of where it's been done right, where immigration has been done in a way to integrate the community, where the lead local institutions, the schools, the churches, have been at the forefront of basically building a cohesive and integrated community where immigrant and native alike are working cheek by jowl in local institutions and on PTAs and so on. Uh, the St. James area in Minnesota, in southern Minnesota, is one of those places where they've done a really good job with, the, again, a, a, about 25 to 30 percent of their local population now are Hispanic. But they've, you know, again, the, but the schools and the churches have, have been at the forefront of the efforts there. But here's, a, you know, as I said, for Every one of those, there are five or six other examples of where it hasn't been handled correctly and it hasn't been done right. And where, you know, again, I, I have to sort of lay the blame at, at you know, some of these bigger conglomerates. They've used immigration to drive down wages. And if you're a native worker, all you see is that your pay packet got smaller because these guys came and took the jobs. And that's the truth of it. You don't need to see anything else to, 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 you know, but that. So one of the things we need to do is to change our labor practices, enforce the laws that we have, not make new ones, enforce the ones that we have, and allow people to organize. I think if you allowed people to organize, those jobs would be better jobs for everybody, not for, just for immigrants, but for natives too. Well, great. 
Thank you. Uh, you know, for those of you that are submitting questions, if you put your questions on a $20 bill, it would get more privacy up there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I, several people, uh, several questions have come in, and I'm going to try to summarize it by, by one here that I think gets at the notion. I am from a and this is really dealing with boomerangs. It sounds like the set of folks here in the audience. I'm from a small town, and now uh, I, I live in a hollowed out town. Uh, how can I, as an outsider, so someone who's returned, but now they're defined as an outsider, make my community better? It's really a question, you know, was raised here, had roots here, was successful, or came back home finding things, uh, and there's several people who have sort of asked that around that question, Patrick. So advice for the boomerangers that have returned. Okay. <clears throat> That's a terrific question, and it's one that I, I don't like to be too prescriptive because, you know, who am I to be saying what you should do with your life? Um, but the one thing I would say, if we're all good at something, what are you good at, and how can you use whatever you're good at to improve your town. So you might be a good organizer. So are you the kind of person who could take the lead in convening stakeholders? You might be an innovator or an entrepreneur. You might have an idea for the next great thing. Could you go and convince somebody to give you a loan to start that small business? Could you work with another businessman to, again, co-finance that and say, this is something that I think will, will fly? Are you the kind of person who could go to a state body and say, are there any grants for us to build renewable energy? One of the things that, you know, I talk to people about, you know, in terms of our energy independence, there's no reason why small towns can't be energy producers. How much sun do you get here? How much wind do you get here? Where's, you know, the potential for geothermal energy, right? Can you think of a small town that has 2,000 people, the likes of Ellis, that produces enough energy not only just to power itself, but that when the day comes, and the day will come when we have a national grid, that they're actually able to sell a surplus to the national grid and use that to finance their schools, whatever they make. It's not unfeasible. It's actually, you know, so are you the person who could lead that and say, listen, I'm the one that's going to go and get the state grants for solar, wind, whatever it is. Patrick, uh, we have some college students in the, in the audience, and, and uh, the question is, uh, as a soon graduating student of a, of a university, and being born and raised in a small Iowa town, should I go back? <laughs> Okay, <laughs> you're gonna get, you're gonna you're gonna give me an Oprah moment up here where I'm I'm gonna be, you know, cheerleading and telling everybody what to do. But um, and I really don't I don't want to do that. I, I think Oprah's awesome, but I, I'm just not cut that way. Um, I think you have to do what you think is right. I mean, I think look at the end of the day. You've probably invested a lot in your education. You've worked hard to get where you are, whoever you are, right? There's probably a few of you here. And you have to do, you know, you have to, I mean, part of what we all have to do is realize our potential, and sometimes it's going to take us somewhere else. I left, right? Uh, but I left because I was paid to leave. <laughs> you might, it's uniquely Irish that the only... The only scholarship to do a doctorate in 1992 was the traveling scholarship. So they basically said to me, here's some money, why don't you just leave? <laughs> and so I did. And, I remember, and you know, here's the, 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 the kicker to the story was several years ago, not even, no, several years later, a few years ago, I was back at my alma mater doing a job interview for, to be a professor. Basically, they were going to give me the keys to my old place which was, I think it was lunacy. They must have been on some kind of drugs or something. But they said to me, you know, so if you took this job, what would you do? I said, well, one of the first things I would do 
is I would stop paying people to leave. I'd be investing in people to stay. Because that to me is a crazy use of your resources. And it's funny, the people who got the, the scholarship I got, and we're, we're kind of a weird, disparate group. Every one of us is still either in America or Australia. None of us went back. So they had a 100% success rate sending people away <laughs> and not coming back, you know. So, so I, think, you know, I think part of it is you, you, you've got to go where you can realize your potential. But the one thing I would say is, can you think of a way that your talents can benefit your town? Now, here's the thing. If you're an achiever, do you have to be actually physically in your town to help them? I don't think you do. So the guys in Minor South Dakota, here's what they're doing. That's Rural Learning Center. Check it out on the web. I think they might still have, they have, a, they have a webcam up of them building their new Rural Learning Center, $6 million facility. Most of the money they raise themselves. And the, the guy that runs it, Randy, says, you know, he says, I get these emails from our achievers. And they're saying, you know, I left, I feel bad about leaving. It's awesome what you're doing. How can I help? And so he's like, sure you can help. Donate some money. You know, are you good at graphic design? Can, you know, he finds ways to get them to do things for him. Are you a planner? Can we use a plan? Can we, you know, so we, so look at, we Facebook, we tweet, we do all these things. We're connected all the time. You don't have to physically be in your town to make a difference. Could you start a Facebook page for your town? Could you get other people who are all over the country and all over the world involved? Could you invest in the solar panels that will bring energy independence to your town? Sure you could. Do you have the next great idea for somebody who's gone back there for, to build jobs? That might be what you could do. So again, we can think outside the box and how we can contribute. Thus far, I've not gotten any $20 bills, but my stack is getting larger. Uh, question, question that, uh, that comes, uh, that, that came in is, uh, deals with sort of how rural culture and small communities are oftentimes portrayed in the mass media. And the question is, how can, how can you portray the image of a welcoming community when talk radio sends a contrary message. And I guess I'd expand that beyond talk radio. Several movies that really make people that live in small towns in the country either either hicks or hillbillies or unsophisticated narrow gaugers uh, that are hostile to change. And as one person here indicated that we lack imagination. It's a kind of a broad stereotype, but oftentimes it's portrayed in the media. Um, got some thoughts on, on what we might do? Well, um, you know, I, I think there's something to be said, said about that. Um, and it's a question we get asked a lot. So, and it's funny, you know, you do, you know, interviews with particularly people on the coasts and the question comes up like this, and it's a subtle question, but you can see what they're kind of getting at, right? So how was it? <laughs> you know, living in a small town, how was it? Oh, it was so tough. We had to drive 50 miles to Starbucks, and you couldn't get the New York Times. It was like being, no, I mean, but, you know, we say it was great. We had a wonderful experience, which is the truth. Um, but we'd been there before. See, this is the thing. Is that we, this wasn't the first time. So we, you know, we knew what it was like. But it sounds to me, if I can sort of parlay into the previous answer, there's a project for an aspiring young achiever, returner, high flyer, boomerang filmmaker to make, right? Make a, make a movie, write a movie about what it's really like to grow up in a small town. Right, that isn't deliverance. <laughs> okay? You know, or it's not, you know, justified or winter's bone or one of those things, right? Which are awesome in their own way, but, you know, there's also 
caricatures in there, right? So I think that's one thing you could do. And there are enough Iowa writers that have written so evocatively about this place and about the beauties and the mysteries and the tapestry of small town life that there's plenty of source material to adapt. Are you ready for the next question? I'm ready. Several have asked the question if you would comment on the influence of big box retailers and the devastating impact of discount uh, big box stores has had on the fabric of, of uh, rural Iowa, rural America. Absolutely, um, and and that's it. I mean, that's the, the devastating impact. So you know, the main streets have really been eviscerated by big box retailing. And I think, and again, it's it's one of those things that we pretty much all engage in because we, we go where our dollar goes further. But we don't realize the cumulative impact of our consuming decisions on places. Now here's the thing, the minor South Dakota people, uh, and again, this, this guy, you know, he's an awesome guy. You should check him out, Randy. So when he was a high school teacher, one of the things he did was he, he did this project where he had the young people basically do an economic survey of, you know, what they're, they're basically their purchasing decisions. And he had them sort of document, you know, where their dollars were spent and what effect that had on the town in terms of, you know, their, their retail. And he said it was just an amazing process because they began to realize that just by spending as much money as they were in the Walmarts and the Targets and whatever else, that they were completely destroying their local economy. And he said that not only was it that aha moment, but they started to change their behavior. They started to spend, you know, sp you know, spend more money and tell their parents to do that. To spend it in the local hardware store, not the Home Depot or whatever, right? That, and I, you know, it's, it's, I don't think that's the only thing that needs to happen. I think, you know, one of the things is, I think we need to try and incentivize small businesses in some ways to stay open. I think we need to levy some money from these big box retailers. You know, they're always touting about how much they invest in local communities. Oh, but then when you look a little closer, you just wonder where all that investment is actually going. And in the small towns where we've been, I mean, I don't see any trickle down whatsoever. Make them. You know, if you're Walmart and you're saying, oh, we're investing in local communities where we serve and we do this and this, okay then. Let's see it. Let's see you build a swimming pool and, a, you know, help with the library extension and do whatever else. And, you know, and then, you know, you, at least you make them responsible citizens. You're still not going to solve the, the larger issue. I think that's changing consumer behavior is very, very difficult, but at least you'll mitigate some of the worst effects. Uh, I was handed a note here, Patrick, that said uh, one last question. There's a reason why this podium has wheels and they're going to roll me out. Uh, but so I saved this question to last. I, you know, you always want to leave, you always want to leave on a high note. So this is, I'm going to read this verbatim. Alice is my hometown. Really? I always felt that the preference for mediocrity pay, uh, uh, paying for highly trained people like me, uh, contributes to their leaving. Did you find this attitude among the people of, of uh, mediocre pay for high performance? Uh, quote, we like to say getting a deal. Paying people less than they're worth, that really is a push factor. <coughs> Right. I mean, I, I think that's one of the things, you know, one of the things that comes true very clearly with the, when we talk to the achievers, you know, why did you leave and so on. Um, you know, simply the opportunities and the fact that, you know, they didn't feel that either the opportunities just weren't there or that if they were there that they weren't, you know, remunerated sufficiently for what they did. And, and that's, you know, a, again, 
one aspect of it, but for the most part, the flip side of that then, the complete opposite is, are the people who do come back, those high flyers who do come back, who don't do it for the money. And they're basically economically non-rational because they're behaving conversely to what economists would think they would behave because they say, well, I'm going back because I want those ties. So they value that more than being compensated adequately. And, you know, and then the other thing too is there's, um, if you're a, a professional in a small town, one of the things we heard from the, um, the high flyers who came back, you know, sure you're the professional, you're the doctor, the dentist, the teacher, whatever, but there are so many civic demands on these guys. So that, you know, this young woman who was a doctor said, you know, I can't just close my practice at five o'clock, go home to my kids. She said, I, I gotta sit on this board, that board. I don't mind doing it, but there's that expectation, you're doctor so-and-so, you're involved there and you've got to be there. And so, you know, there's that. And I think that plays into part of the, the, the question there is that it's not just the job you do, but for all of those other things that, um, and for some people, that's a labor of love that they're willing to take on. And for others, you know, the, their sort of career goals take them elsewhere. And I don't think we can't fault people for doing that because they've always done it. I think what we have to do is we have to change the other processes that enable others to take the opportunities that are there and to prepare them for the modern economy. So I think, you know, I would never blame an achiever. And I think that, you know, they, they it's funny. Here's the thing about achiever guilt, like survivor guilt. We did a, a radio show in Philadelphia and a woman called in and she was from rural Missouri and she left her small town in 1963 and she was in tears on the phone because she still felt guilty. <laughs> She said, I, I feel so bad that I left. Am I a bad person because I left? And you know, we said, no, you're not a bad person because you left. You took a decision that many others have taken and it's not the wrong one. But, you know, so there's this sort of, the sort of remorse of leaving. And I think part of that is because, you know, you've got this emotional tie, but you can't blame people. I think what you have to do is change the thinking that will undo this debilitating cycle. Well, we are now at the end of our, really, our question and answer time. And I think you're going to sign some books and hopefully sell some books so that you can pay for your plane ticket back to uh, <laughs> Philadelphia. But uh, again, I want to thank everyone for coming this evening. I wish we had had more time for your questions. But let's show uh, Professor Carr a warm eye.